joining us online, and also if you're watching us uh, on TV, we want to welcome you. Today is going to be something different. It's going to be beautiful. You're going to learn a lot. Um, thank you. But I'm not going to be anchoring this on my own. Um, I'm going to be joined by a wonderful sister. Uh, can I invite uh, Sister Tolu Aguirre to please join, <laughs> join us here. Put those hands together. God bless you. Today, the way it will happen, so you will have the opportunity to ask your questions. Um, the last week, we've asked for questions around giving, because that's what we'll be talking about today. And we've got a few here who will be asking some of these hot questions. Giving, why must we give? Who should we give to, etc. I know this is something uh, very close to the heart of many of us here. Uh, but we'll uh, uh, please establish a few grand rules. Um, the first one is, uh, please feel free to clap if you want to clap. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and also, this is the house of the Lord and there is liberty, so please smile. Feel free to smile. <laughs> and also, you, when you have the opportunity to ask this question, can I ask that you kindly articulate your questions um, before you ask them so that you'll be brief and straight to the point. If you do not um, feel like taking the microphone to ask a question, you can also write it down. We will be asking the questions. Sister Tolu, is there anything I may have missed out around the Andrews? Okay. Excellent. Good morning. Let's put those hands together again. Without wasting your time, I know we came here to listen, and uh, there is no other person uh, than the, the set man in the house. Um, do I, do I start going into the timber and caliber? No. I don't think it's necessary. So, but put your hands together as I invite the senior pastor of Foundation of Truth Assembly to take his seat. Uh, you know, giving. So much has been said about giving. And there's still a lot of gray areas around the story of giving. So, Reverend, do you, you want to maybe throw some lights around why must we give? Why do we have to give? So, what's this whole story? Um, that you're a believer, etc. So you have to give. So why do we give, sir? Now, giving is part of scriptures. Giving is what God has enjoined us to do. Um, money is dear to the heart, so it becomes a controversial issue. Human beings are judged by money, with money, with how we spend money, how we make money. I spoke in the first service today that um, money is a revealer of character. And um, money does not make man. Money reveals who you are. Therefore, that has become a very naughty issue in church. And even outside church but in the bible giving is um very much apparent it's everywhere from genesis to revelation um how much you give to god not just with your money or with your time in service reveals how much you love god in fact god said um he that loveth much you know much we forgiving to him god said he will measure how we relate with him by how much we give to him and when i use the word give i do not mean monetary terms alone or finances alone I mean your life, give your soul to him, give your time, your family, give the things, your talent, your skills, your gifts. And because we, we love our money much more than other things, so we try to measure our relationship with God with um, how much we give to him. In Genesis chapter 1, God spoke about creation. In Genesis chapter 2, he spoke about man, you know, as the ultimate of creation. In Genesis chapter 3, we find out the fall of man. And in Genesis chapter 4, we find a plan of redemption. Unfortunately, many Christians do not realize that. Abel was the first innocent and righteous man mentioned in the scriptures. In fact, the purest blood on earth that was ever shed outside the blood of Jesus was the blood of Abel. And we have very few verses in the entire Bible that speaks about the life of the man called Abel. And one thing we know about Abel, we don't know who he married, we don't know how many kids he had, we know little about any other thing about Abel outside the fact that Abel gave to God. So that speaks volumes about what God loves in man. God, loves, God loved Abel because Abel gave. And the sweet smell offering that Abel gave to God in chapter 4 speaks volumes about the plan of redemption of man that fell in chapter 3. So giving is scriptural and giving is, is, is right. Just a follow-up. Um, yes. uh, you didn't quite mention uh, something I think is important, you know. Yes. Uh, when you give, uh, what about receiving? You know, 
Luke 6, 38 says, the more you give, the more you get. Uh, well, the, the, problem, the problem with Luke 6, verse 38, and with the church folk, is we know how to twist scriptures. We turn them around. Luke chapter 6, verse 38, it, there's something we call contextual interpretation of scriptures. In other words, don't just pick one scripture within a verse in isolation. You interpret a scripture within context. Okay. Now, that scripture wasn't actually speaking about money. Give, it should have given back to your good measure, press down, shaking together, running over. It wasn't speaking about money alone, or in fact, essentially. It was speaking about life, generally. Because they judge not. He says, with which measure you give judgment, you shall receive back unto you. You know, if you read it in context, it was speaking about generally, in life. If you give somebody love, you get back love. Give somebody a smile, you get back smile. Give somebody a handshake, you get back warmth. Get it back, yeah. good measure. Give somebody a slap, you might get twice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, try tomorrow morning on the street of Lagos, slap somebody. You know, if you give that, I guarantee you, you get twice. You know, good measure, shaking together, together. Yeah. running over. Yeah. The person may beat you up, you know. So, I mean, so he's speaking generally, but then we, you can also interpret it with money. Okay. Also goes with money. So you cannot take money out of it. So it goes with money. Great. Yeah. I think that deserves a round of applause. Thank you for shedding light on that. And um, it's appropriate, Pastor, we're in church and um, we hear all sorts of giving. Give to this and give yeah. to that and give for your firstborn and mm -hmm. give for your thirdborn. How many ways can we give as Christians? Well, um, if I go into firstborn of giving and first fruit of giving, we'll, be, we'll, be, we'll not live here today. The first thing we have to know is this statue, that this is a talk show, so it's not a teaching service. If I was doing a teaching service, I would have more time to expound scriptures. Mm -hmm. So I will not go into details, as in scriptural details, mm -hmm. I have to come to Wednesday service, when I'll be sharing in deeper details. However, um, New Testament, what we call the word New Testament, or New Covenant giving, there is nothing first fruit, first born, or first link in the New Testament giving principles or giving pattern. Now, there is a scripture I love so much. It's found in Hebrews chapter 12. It says, Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, of course, 13 verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Oh, yeah. Now, we are Christians, not Judaists. There are three religions on earth that are very linked to Abraham. Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. Judaism has over 6 million people that practice Judaism. It's a religion of those that believe in the law of Moses. They are still alive. They still have them. They have rabbis in Israel and all over the world. They have synagogues up till today. They practice Judaism as a religion. Okay. Now, Judaism still practice firstborn, first fruit, and stuff. Christianity, as the name implies, Christ started with Christ, and everything about that faith ends with Christ. That's why it says, is the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, the faith means our confession, our religion, and our, con our, our conviction. So if you want to practice Christianity, it started with Christ. It started with the times of Christ and ended with everything he did in three and a half years. Mm -hmm. If you want to have a religion called Buddhism, you can't have Buddhism before Buddha. You can't have Hinduism before Hindu. Mm -hmm. You can't have Kasaliism before Kasali. You can't have Mormonism before Joseph Smith. Mm -hmm. it, must start, it must have started with Joseph Smith. You get the point now? Now, Jesus did not teach or preach first fruit. Neither did he practice First fruit, first born. It's supposed to be in Judaism. Numbers chapter 18, Leviticus chapter 3. Now, because it was an agrarian community that Moses led them out of Egypt into Canaan, mm -hmm. he gave them laws. Now, those laws he gave, 639 laws in the book of Moses. There were civil laws, there were ceremonial laws, and there were religious laws. Just like you have a constitution. Yep. Now, you know that lawyers here today, Nigeria has had several constitutions, 1914 constitution, 1999 constitution, 1979 constitution, that is all different constitutions. Now you can't come to this era and start quoting Lord Lugard's constitution. And at that time, slavery was still embraced and practiced. You can go into that constitution, what I call Old Testament, and start saying you want to practice it in the year 2014. We will tell you it is not constitutional. Okay. So also with covenant practice, mm -hmm. it is not covenant. 
new covenant practice to do firstborn, first fruit practice of scriptures of giving. It was in the Old Testament. However, having said that, yeah. let me explain this to you. It's a principle of first. The word there is first. Yeah. God said, everything I deserve the first, the first place in your life. Jesus said it this way, seek ye first the kingdom, the kingdom of God. The word first means primarily and essentially to put God first in your life. Now, God said every first thing that comes out of an animal, we call them firstling, of a human being, we call them firstborn, of um, crops, we call them first fruit. Vegetation, first fruit, mm -hmm. animal, firstling, mm -hmm. and human being, firstborn. Now, Abel gave of the firstling to God. The first thing that that cow gave birth, Abel said, this is dedicated to God. God loved it and God took it. But Cain did not give up the first. So God, I don't like people that put me last. Now, there are people in church that put God last. And we think God will take us. No, God wants a primary place in our lives. That's a principle behind first fruit. Beyond the quantity or the amount, it's a principle of putting God first. That's it. Now, now in the Judaist, Judaism, I read somewhere in the Talmud, Talmud is the law of Moses that people still practice today and um, in the Hadith of Islam. It's Muslims do it as well. They say up to today, in Israel today, today, when a child is born, on the 30th day, the first month, a firstborn child, a rabbi or a Jewish rabbi or priest would take that child, a 30-day-old child, take it to the mother and say, this is the firstborn of your womb, yes or no. The mother will say publicly in the synagogue, yes. The rabbi will ask, have you had any miscarriage before now? The woman will say no, if she has had none. Then the rabbi will say, this belongs to God. Okay. The rabbi will face the father, like we do in church, a dedication service, and ask the father, father, this belongs to God. Do you want to redeem this child? Mm -hmm. the, the father will say yes. Then the priest will place a particular finances, five shekel, ten shekel, on the father. The father will pay and the child will be given back to the father. Okay. That is what they call firstborn redemption. Okay. Wow. So you've redeemed your firstborn child okay. once and for all. Okay. So it's not an annual fee. Okay. I understand some churches party today. Yeah, that's so actually the reason I asked. So mm -hmm. having said that, and I yeah. think it's clear, having said that, in, in how many ways can we give as Christians anyway? What kinds of offerings should we be giving? Yeah. Excellent. Now, New Testament giving. You know, I've often asked people, can we try to study the Jesus church? Imagine Jesus being alive today and having a church. What? Let's look at how he would, would raise his money. How did Jesus get funds? People give to Jesus. Yeah. There are five. I have six. I have six kind of New Testament giving that I have found out. I've studied the book of Matthew through to Revelation. Matthew to and the book of um, the epistles of Paul. The modern day church, the Gentile church, was built on the revelations of Paul the Apostle. Um, it was once sent to the Gentile nation all over the world. Peter was sent to the Jewish nation. So the foundations of the modern day church, Gentile church, was built on the revelations of Paul. And Paul spoke a lot about giving. There are five kinds of giving that we can find in New Testament. In New Testament as well. Now the first is, of course, the controversial one, tithe. People have said, oh, tithe is not in New Testament. Now, Jesus in Matthew 23, verse 23, said something about tithe. And Christians need to know that. He spoke to the Jews. He said, you guys pay tithe, watch me, of mint, of cumin. However, you abandon the heavier matters of the law. Justice, peace, and compassion, and mercy on the poor. However, I want you to do this and not undo that. So Christ did not condemn tithing. He only said tithing is a lighter matter, but not a no matter. He didn't say don't tithe, he said tithe. In the book of Hebrews, we find tithing there. Now because the book was written to the, to the Jews that were saved yes. in the church. Yes. Not to the Jews practicing Judaism, but the Jews that were saved in the church, yep. we find tithe there. Okay. Now the writer of the book of Hebrews who is still very controversial. People don't know who wrote it. Some say Paul, some say it's not Paul, but we don't want to know who. They say it's not Paul because Paul was not sent to the Hebrews, was sent to the Jews. So and then he didn't have the literary style of Paul the Apostle. That's what theologians and scholars have argued about. No less theologians who wrote the book of Hebrews. Let's also look at the content. Yep. He says, 
To who? Melchizedek. Now, Abraham is the father of the modern day faith. In Galatians chapter 4, is that all of us that are of Christ. Abraham's seed, that means I'm of Christ. Yeah. Now, if you look at that, Abraham paid tithe yeah. to Melchizedek. We are of Abraham's seed yeah. because we are of Christ. Okay. So it is imperative for us to pay tithe. Tithe means tenth. Yeah. I know people don't understand that. The word tithe is simply an old anglo sax word, an old English word. You know, anglo sax developed into English. Anglos and the Saxons. There is an old English word called tent. Tight tent. Tent tight. Tent tight. Tight tent. Somebody asked me once, I think it was to Nurapo, can I pay, if I pay 20%, am I paying tight? As I paid 20. Because <laughs> that's not tenth. Yeah. Tight simply means tenth. Yeah. It's an English word that means tenth. A tenth of your earnings belongs to God. What's the category of giving? Second is the prophet offering. Reverend, where is that? It's in scriptures. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 41, he that gives a cup of cold water to my disciples in the name of a prophet shall... Mm -hmm. A prophet's offering is where you connect with the prophetic okay. in your life. You know, a pastor, a teacher, an evangelist, a teacher teaches the word. A prophet speaks a prophetic word and it connects with your destiny. Okay. You feel this is God speaking to me, it gives you a breakthrough, but some supernatural things. How do you connect with the supernatural? You give something to that prophet. Paul spoke about it where in Philippians chapter 4. He said, nobody communicated to me via giving and receiving, okay. but the church in Philippi alone. Okay. Therefore, my God shall supply all your needs. This my means the God of this prophet shall meet your needs. So we should give prophets offering, number two. We should pay tithe, number one. Number three, the giving to the poor. Now, giving to the poor is very important. When I just searched my scriptures, I found out that the treasury of Jesus was devoted to three things. One, giving to the poor. Two, giving to the apostles. And three, feeding himself and paying for their bills. He paid their bills. Now, Jesus gave to the poor. Now, he didn't have too much, much money. He didn't have too much money. But he still gave to the poor. Because I know poor people in church like that. They say, ah, praise God, they're going to give to us. No, even the poor should give to the poor. Even the poor. Second Corinthians chapter 8. When Paul was talking to the Corinthian church, he said, out of your deep poverty, you still gain. Your liberality shows off. I don't like those that are professional poor people in church that love to just take, take, take and not give. No matter how poor you are, you can give a widow's mind. So giving to the poor is also the third kind of giving. The fourth, giving, thanksgiving. Now thanksgiving is when you appreciate God, when you get a breakthrough, a miracle, you go and show appreciation. Now, a few people do not like me when I speak about thanks. I'm one man that loves gratitude. And those in church that don't show gratitude, I don't like them. I don't want to work with them. And when you preach like this, say, hey, Pastor, are you saying that we should be thanking you for what you've done? Are you not doing it for God? Can't you just leave it to God? No, no, no. Even Jesus himself complained. Jesus. Christ. Yeah. The most perfect creature on earth complained. Christ complained. He said, didn't I heal ten people? Didn't I heal ten of them? Where are the nine? Where are they? They didn't come to thank me. So if Christ can complain about nine people, yeah. So why shouldn't I complain? I'm Christ-like. <laughs> so when I give people things in church and they don't thank me, I get angry with them. Even Christ complain, clap for Jesus, everybody clap, clap, clap. Yes, oh, sir. yeah. <laughs> if Christ complain, I should complain as well. Yeah. Right. He said, once ten healed, where are the nine? You're like your father. I'm like my father, thank you, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. That's the fourth, the fourth, the fourth one. one. Now the fifth is worship offering. Thou shall not come to God's presence without an offering. Every Sunday, every Wednesday that you approach God's presence, take something to the place. Okay. That was the offering Jesus mentioned in Matthew chapter 5 when he said, if thou come to the presence of God with something, an offering, and you remember you have an ought against your brother, mm. don't give it yet, go and settle. Christ was speaking about what? Worship offering there. Every man that goes to God's presence on a Bible study day, on a night vigil, on a Sunday morning should not go empty handed. You are going to his presence to worship him. It's an insult on God. Go with something precious, something good, and say, oh, this is yours. Okay. Now, the sixth giving, I've given you five, yeah. New Testament giving. The sixth is kingdom expansion or missions. Second Corinthians chapter 8, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 15. The early church took money from the richer church to pay for the smaller churches to expand the kingdom work all over the world. That's why missionaries came to Nigeria from America. They gave towards the gospel expansion in Africa. 
They still gave towards it. We have a branch in Lekki. We need money for it. We have a branch in Festat. We have a branch everywhere. So we're going to be saying, look, God, give us money to expand Expand, the kingdom business all over the world. That are the six kind of New Testament giving. Anything outside that, I've not found it. (laughs) Thank you, sir. (laughs) Okay. Um, thank you so much, uh, Reverend. Yeah. We'll get back to tight. We are not true with tight. You're, you're not going to get. You're not going to get away that easy. <laughs> um, there is a question around what you just mentioned. You you said six type of giving. Um, Go ahead. Okay. Can you clarify this story of you know um, sowing towards a certain reprieve from God? So, for instance, yeah, because you've mentioned this is giving now, so. This is not part of it. So, if, for instance, you are sick, uh, you they say give. Yeah. If, for instance, um, yeah, you want a car or something, give towards it. Uh, I don't know what, what this is, they call it, uh, seeding or something yeah, like that. Sewing. So um, maybe if you want a husband or something, maybe the, maybe you can sew. The woman can sew a husband. I don't know. So, <laughs> so can you clarify this? Sir? Well, because I'm a Bible believing. Bible preaching, Bible teaching, Bible loving, Bible practicing pastor. I'm here to find that in scriptures. Okay. Um, pastor, but it's working. There's something called syncretism. Because we tend to think something is working, yeah. then it is right. I'm not too sure it's right because it's working. I'm not even sure it's working as much as possible. Because we have more problems, more people that have issues with it. I think you cannot bribe God. What you call soul is actually coming to you are paying for a blessing. Okay. There is no price tag on God's blessings. Everything is by God's grace. Thank you. There is no price tag on God's blessings. We are saved by grace and we are blessed by grace. The moment I pay for it, then I bought it. I bought it. Then God, God does not have a business asking me to come and thank him. If I go to a store and I buy something, it becomes mine. Mm-hmm. So if I have to, don't we, we target so, but what we're really saying is buy. Okay. You want a child, come and pay for it. So when you pay money, then God will give it to you. And that's why God does some things. It's grace. It's unmerited. It's favor. Lest any man should boast. However, the only passage in scripture that we use sometimes are two passages. One is Genesis chapter 8, verse 22. When God gave an earthly principle when after he devastated the world after Noah, he said, as long as the earth shall live, earth is an earthly principle, seed time and harvest shall not cease. The sun, the moon, the night and day, summer and winter. Now, my anger is that do we do anything to provoke summer? Do we? No. The summer comes, the summer goes. Mm-hmm. Winter comes, winter goes. Yep. God was giving a principle of seasons in that passage. Okay. That when seed time comes, sow your seed agriculturally so that you can reap a harvest when it's time to harvest. It will give the rain. When summer comes, dress for summer. When it's cold in winter, wear your winter jacket. When it's night, go to bed. When it's day, wake up and go to work. That's what it means in that passage. The second one is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And that one is meant for pastors, actually. And I use that a lot. Paul said, if we have sowed into your life spiritual things, is it wrong if we reap material things? Now, Paul was speaking about men of God according to his scriptural indexes, saying we can get money from the church. Mm -hmm. Now, I get paid salary by this church. And that's where I reap because I work in this church. I sow spiritual things. I reap material things. That's what Paul meant in that passage. In fact, Paul was now saying in that passage that he refrained from reaping lest he should hinder the gospel of Christ. Now, any time I read that passage, I quake and I I tremble. Because he was saying, I would rather go broke than affect or hinder the body and the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because money matters, Sister Tolu, can hinder the gospel. Can hinder the gospel. So, sowing and reaping that we do, oh, you want a child, come and sow, you get a child. You want a breakthrough? Come and so you get a breakthrough. We are trying to do what I call Ifa logic. You know Ifa? Ifa yeah, priests. We brought African traditional religion into Christianity. Those days you go to Ifa priests, you, you speak to the money, 
Then the far priest said, come and bring a shaker, bring a goat, bring a ram, bring a cat, that if I need it, you give it to Ifa, then they say you get your child. Well, I'm praying for our blessing. So I don't think it's, it's New Testament. You can't find one passage in the New Testament church where that was done. Thank you. Pastor, Thank I you think so what much, you yeah. just said is so liberating. Yeah. So there are two, two questions I want to ask very quickly. The first one is, if I don't pay tithe, I don't give tithe, whichever word you decide to use. Um, I choose pay. Thank you, sir. I knew you were going to do that. So. <laughs> Thank I, you. I, I pay my tithe. <laughs> so if I don't pay tithe, like you pay never bills because you, you owe it, if I don't pay tithe, will I miss heaven? No. The Bible doesn't say you miss heaven. There's nowhere in the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation that says if you don't pay your tithe, you won't go to heaven. Okay. But Thank the, you. The, but the windows of heaven won't be open to you. Uh -huh. Aha. Yeah. <laughs> then, then to just follow that up very quickly. Um... <laughs> the windows of heaven in Malachi chapter 3, not the doors of heaven. Uh, the you, know, you know, prophet Malachi said, prove God here with if the windows of heaven will not open, open and God will not pour you out a blessing. Yes. I told my wife, I said, I want both the doors of heaven and the, and the windows. Open. The gate of heaven you will enter, window on earth will pour you blessing. <laughs> there will be no blessing on earth, but, you know, you may get to heaven poor. But just before you, I just wanted to ask around this. I have seen many persons who don't pay tithe in church, sir. Yes. And they appear to be prospering. I mean... What's the explanation They're not for this? Oh, okay. They are just rich. You see, people don't know the difference between rich is and blessing. Proverbs 10, 22 says, the blessing of the Lord make it rich. Mm -hmm. The blessings of the Lord is different from riches. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm telling you the truth. I let go down, God does not pay tithe. Let's, let's put our hands together for that. That's I, I, yes, wonderful. Because Christians wonderful, tend to yeah. think, oh, I don't pay tithe and I'm rich mm -hmm. and I'm blessed. You're not mm -hmm. blessed, you're only rich. Mm -hmm. And those riches are vulnerable. Mm -hmm. When the Bible speaks about can can woman, the mm -hmm. devourer, mm -hmm. He speaks about the generator that is getting spread every, every month. The, 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 child, the child hospital bills you pay. Mm -hmm. Your car that gets spoiled. Your wealth is not preserved and protected. You may not know it. You know what they call blessing? Do you know what a blessing is? You need to go and study what the blessings of Abraham was. When God said, I will bless you to Abraham mm -hmm. in Genesis 12, he wasn't speaking money to you alone. Because Abraham had cattle, silver, and gold. Yeah. Verse number 6 of Genesis 12. The Bible says Abraham left out of Chadia with his wealth. Yet God says, I will bless you. Wait a minute. So what's the blessing? Yeah. There's something bigger than riches that's yeah. called the blessing. Yeah. It comes from yeah. above. Yeah. You're protected. Yeah. You're preserved. <laughs> Hallelujah. So just very close to what Bro Obwele just asked. Yes. So I've been in church for a long time. I've given of my possessions. Yes. And actually things are not moving. Yes. My mates have left me behind. Yes. And things are not changing. Yes. This giving thing doesn't seem to be working, Pastor. Check your motive, my sister. Eh? <laughs> number say one, that again, sir. I'll say check your motives, number one. Oh, motive, okay. Number one, giving works. There are three things about giving that you need to understand. I've studied the New Covenant, and if you want to know what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9, mm -hmm. chapter 7, 8, 9, 8 and 9 in particular, he speaks about three things about giving. One, the attitude of giving is what God takes more. Yeah. God loves a cheerful giver, yeah. not the one that gives grudgingly. Yeah. Two, the measure of giving. Now, attitude is number one. Measure is number two. Measure is the quantity you give. So Paul also spoke about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. He said you should give bountifully and not sparingly. Bounty versus sparingly means quantity. However, measure, that is even from attitude. Attitude speaks about giving cheerfully and not grudgingly. Now, if I give bountifully but grudgingly, God won't take it. Mm -hmm. Do you notice he said God loves a cheerful giver? Mm -hmm. In that passage, he didn't say God loves a bountiful giver. Mm -hmm. Paul advised as man, give bountifully. Mm -hmm. But if I can tell you the one that God loves more, cheerfully. God accepts cheerful giving. What, the Greek word cheerful in that passage means hilarious. To be joyful, to be happy, yeah. to, be, to be glad. Not to complain, you're angry, you're grudging, you're screaming, you're, you're complaining. That's not how God will take it. So sometimes when we say we give, 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 and my life is not getting better, that means I've been initial, even you're giving it 40. Because, and number one, look at the six offers I just showed you. Yeah. You're not giving because you want something better. Yeah. I'm giving because it deserves it. Yeah. I mean, it deserves my worship offering. It deserves my thanksgiving offering. It deserves, it is, the tithe is its own. So I'm not saying no, as I'm giving, I'm looking for better things. So if it's not getting better, I'll stop giving. No. no. <laughs> because That's the funny. game then. Yes. <laughs> Just something around that, uh, yes. Reverend. Uh, Psalm 126 yes. uh, talks about sowing in tears. Yeah. So how do you relate that? Well, to cheerful giving. Yes, you will 
reap with joy. He that cometh, you know, with, to sow with yeah, tears we will come joy. back with joy. Now, tears in that scripture means sacrifice. Okay. Means painfully. Means to, to give something that costs you a lot. That's with tears. But you can still give it hilariously. Like David said to that guy, he said, I cannot give God what will not cost me anything. Please name your price. I want something to be, and I'm giving this carefully. That widow's mite was giving cheerfully. She dropped her pens, her widow's tamp tamp, two, two mites. Luke 21, verses 1 to 3. And the rich man came with bags of money. And Jesus said, that woman is giving her all. Now that's sowing with tears. That's giving with tears. And God says, you see her, she has given much more than those that are dropping bags of money. So the word tears there means to, you're, you're, you're coming to God's presence with your very last dime. And you're still dancing. You say, yeah. God, this belongs to you. It's sacrifice. yours. A sacrifice. You're giving something sacrificially. Yeah. You, know, you can give offering and it doesn't cost you so much. Yeah. You can give a thousand, right? You don't, don't move a muzzle. You, you know that that's nothing. In fact, you can give a million and it doesn't move A million you. doesn't Depends move you. Know, yeah. I have 200 million. How much is a million? I bet you that one million. That's no <laughs> sacrifice. But if you give something that pains you, yeah. that costs you, yeah. that's what in my tears. God says, you will certainly weep with joy. Related to that, Pastor, yes. I've heard in some churches, um, when it's offering time, you're asked to look at your neighbor. Yeah. If your neighbor doesn't have an offering, then you offer your neighbor something. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, who's doing the giving? Is it me or the neighbor? You are the one doing the giving. Okay. The neighbor that comes to the presence of God without anything is insulting God. All right. I don't believe that you don't have anything to give. I don't believe that the poorest of the poor cannot give God under them. Mm. I don't believe it. Mm. And I am pain that some people think, oh, I don't have money to give to God. You must give. I don't believe it. I believe it just don't believe God needs your money. Let me tell you the problem we have in church. Christians have this mistake. They look at your wealth to judge if they should give you something. Especially pastors. That's right. Reverend Castanio does not need my money. No, it's not my person. It's my office. That's right. So when we look at God, does God need my hundred naira? Mm. Will my two thousand naira make a difference in God's bank account? He doesn't need it. So we tend to think, since God does not need it, why am I giving him? But that's, that's not why. You're giving not because he needs, but because he deserves. Yeah. Put your hands together if you wish to do that. Um, I'm going to ask you. Well, the book. principle of giving. Okay. God deserves it. Okay. God is not poor. God is not broke. A cattle on a thousand hills belongs to God. Yet God still demands for us to give him. Why? Is it because he needs it or he wants it? No. He wants to know. You know, when God asked Abraham, give me your son, was it because, no, God wanted to test Abraham's love. Okay. To prove Abraham, whether Abraham truly loved him. Yeah. And when Abraham gave that son, God said, now truly, you have proven to me that you love me. What we give to things, ask him, do you need it? That's a very selfish gift. You don't look at that need. You look at that office and that person. It is this office I'm giving to. When you go to the president, and the governor. That's true. Why do we give to them? That's true. Why do we give Vashala birthday money? <laughs> Doesn't need the money. He's a no. billionaire. We give to the office of the governor. You look at the office of the president. That's right. The office of the governor. You can't go to the governor's office. Like, you are poorer than him. Mm. You're going to take a loan to go and bring mm. a special gift. Mm. You're expensive. You're expensive, sir. <laughs> That's true. It's the office. If you look at the person, he's richer than you, but you honor the office. When you go to your MD's office on his birthday, why do you buy him cards? That's right. Because it's your MD. You give to the office of that MD. Okay. Same with God. He sits in the throne of the earth. He's El Shaddai. Mm -hmm. He's Almighty. Mm -hmm. He's Jehovah. He's Jehovah. You come to his presence and say, Lord, you deserve it. I'm giving to you, not because you need it, but to your office as God over my life. One key clarification. Thank you so much, uh, Reverend. One key clarification. Then yeah. we'll uh, go to the congregation to pick up questions. Um, just a follow-up on what you just said. Yeah. There are so many men of God today. Um, who are stupendously wealthy. Yeah. And, um, you know, you begin to ask yourself, uh, yeah, I, I, why should I give him one, my 1,000 naira when he's a multi billionaire? And yeah. So, how do you see that? And, and he probably has helicopters and uh, a few private jets, PJs. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm a bushman. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what PJ means. PJ, private jets. Private jets. <laughs> 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 Go ahead. Yeah, so really, that's it. Uh, so, uh, how do you I, how do you think you should uh, approach giving when you are on that that kind of uh, ministry? Well, I I think that is a very delicate question. I believe strongly that Jesus did not choose. Let's look at it, how Jesus spent his treasury, okay. the money in his treasury. 
He had a treasurer, his name was Judas. John chapter 12 tells us that, that Judas kept the bag and was a thief. Uh -huh. So Jesus had a treasury. Did Jesus use his money to buy? Could Jesus have bought a donkey? Yes. He traveled far and wide, but he didn't use his money to buy a donkey. He had money, a little bit of money. Luke chapter 8 verses 1 to 3 tells us how Jesus got his money. Part of those that gave to Jesus were those that worked in Herod's palace. Herod's palace, a chooser, a steward in Herod's palace, worked for who? Worked for Jesus. Okay. They were supporting the ministry of Christ with funding. Now, did Jesus buy an, a, mobi a mobility, symbol of mobility? No. When he needed one, he used his, he, he worked all through his ministry. When he needed one to fulfill biblical prophecy, he borrowed one. You know it. He had to borrow one. Now, do I think he could not have used part of that money in his treasury to buy a donkey? Oh, no, I think he could have done that. Maybe he could have bought 12 donkeys for the 12 apostles. <laughs> Clap for Jesus, everybody. <laughs> so, so every time he moved around, he was over with donkeys. Mm -hmm. But he didn't do that. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe in excesses. And I believe that we as pastors can hinder the gospel of Christ. I believe that we should be, I believe in moderation in all things. I believe that the wealth of the church should be different from the wealth of a man. Your church should be wealthier than you. Unfortunately, today, we don't know how to divide the wealth of the church from the wealth of the pastor. When people give to an assembly, they give to the organization that you run. You should place yourself on salary as a pastor. If you tell me you buy your debt from your own salary, then God bless you. God bless you. And then if you want to do that, I, I, I have no qualms about that. I'm not going to condemn you. But I just hope you are living a simple life. Mm -hmm. Because we need to be simple. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, like I said, I like that passage a lot. He said there in verse number 11, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if you should reap kind of things? So I don't say anything wrong in pastors being blessed. However, if others be partakers of this power over you, are we not rather? Nevertheless, watch, we have not used this power. Now you can use the power and you can abuse the power. Everything that can be used can be abused. Can be abused. Everything that can be used can be abused. I can use my authority over you and I can abuse my pastoral authority over you. Now, I think there's a lot of abuse today, not just use. Okay. Now, Paul said, I did not use this power. You know why? But I allow all things lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. I think our abuse, which means abnormal use of power, okay. abuse means abnormal use of power. Oh, we have authority to buy jets, to buy this, to buy everything. I can say, okay, church funds, buy me a new car every week, every month. But that's an abuse of power. I don't need it. That's living an excessive life. We should be moderate. We should be modest. We should be simple. The Bible speaks about the simplicity that is in Christ. We should, that's why the Catholic organization, the Baptist, the, the Anglicans, the Baptist, they seem to be a bit more modest than us Pentecostals. We look at everything and we live excessive lifestyle. Yeah. I think we have abused our spiritual and pastoral authorities and right over the church. Yeah. That's my question. Okay. Straight on the back of that, and yeah. we will be coming to the audience in a few minutes. If I already am in a ministry yes. and I am beginning to sense that actually my pastor is going on that path, is becoming quite extravagant, should I start to sow my, my tithes and my offerings in another ministry? What would you advise me to do? Bible says, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. Yeah. The corn you eat is being done by one ox. But, but Pastor, First the horse is already very big. Sorry? The horse is very big. <laughs> <laughs> the ox is very big. <laughs> it's very big, yes, sir. Uh, this one is very big. <laughs> You're not serious. <laughs> I hope you can see most. As long as he's still, he's still doing the job. Exactly. You know. Mm. Now, my answer has to be two in one. The first is very very serious if you're not comfortable in the church change our church i yomi kasali have a problem with any member of my church here that does not believe in my person my style yes. and says there leave this church yes. the door is open that, that's my view but if you believe in my person my character that this man is leading us somewhere then stay if you have access to me and people more people have access to me and you have issues with the lifestyle i'm living so why are you driving a jeep come to my office I will tell you how I got my money to buy my Jeep and why I'm driving my Jeep. And if you think, sir, I expect you to be driving a damn I don't like you. 
getting a jeep. I'm leaving your church because you're driving a damn fool. Frankly, I will not be offended. I personally will not be offended. Secondly, I do not believe in tithing into another church. Where you get fed is where you should tithe. That's why I use the word, the ox that treads out the corn that feeds you. That's where you should keep. You should tithe there. That's your storehouse. So if you're not comfortable, then If you're not check comfortable, out. check out. That means it's a very tough call, but I think for the safety and salvation of your soul, mm -hmm. check out. Yep. Someone said the choice of a church is more important no, the than choice the of choice of a job. Absolutely. Absolutely. Excellent. Absolutely. Uh, thank Please you. clap, clap. I like, that. I like that. It's not my saying, though. I like that. I'm coaching <laughs> someone. Well, that's a good one. I like that. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Sister Tolu. I think we'll uh, give opportunity for the congregation to actually ask questions. If the ushers could maybe just pass the mic around. And again, if you want to remain anonymous, you can do your question on a piece of paper Indeed. And, and pass it to the Reverend. Indeed. Any hands, any takers, just raise up your hand. Yes, please. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I um, really want to thank God for this talk show. It's very, very educational. Um, Pastor, please, speaking of um, sacrificial giving, and um, you mentioned the phallogy. I don't know. I don't know if I got it right. Um, I'm not sure. If phallogy, I don't even. If phallogy, is it phallogy? Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm trying to compare the two of them because I've been to churches where they have to, they had to give sacrificial giving at the end of the day, and then um, it was um, it came with a huge request. And then you mentioned something like phallogy, bring money to the shrine, and you say something to it. I don't know even how to compare the two. I don't know if you'll get my question. Pastor, you get it? Yeah. So Sacrificial you, you, giving, like he mentioned in Psalm 126, yeah. 126, it's showing in tears. Now I believe that when it has to do with tears, it's a burden request. Yeah. And the phallogy, like I don't know if I'm pronouncing it well, it also comes with request in the shrine somehow. Now how do I, you know, the two of them, I'm trying to combine the two of them. I don't know if you get my question. I, I, I think it's a, it's a, a phallogy thing. But I think it extends beyond the fact. I think you are looking at the seed. We're talking about the yeah. seed. Uh, the seed. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's where. Him. Yeah. Tell him. Tell him. Tell him that. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. You, you, you are the one that was talking. <laughs> let me, let me, let me. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. You may sit down. Let's clap for you. Clap Let's put the hands clap. together. Let me take two, three questions and I'll answer. Second one, please. Another one, so I can take okay. two, three at the same time. This is Dickens and Gossip, please. If I allow you, there's a question in front. Let me write it down. Okay. Write the questions down. Praise I'll, God. I'll take two, three questions. Now, the Bible said, give and it shall be given unto you. Now, I don't know if the Bible specified who should give. Now, if, for example, if, if I'm an addict criminal, now I now give from what, as in from the job. Now, will I receive since I've given? God? The Bible said, give and it shall be given unto you. And it doesn't specify who should give. So that's my question. Can you please clap for this man? Adding criminal. Mm. Adding criminal. Yes. Adding criminal. It's given from the proceeds of his uh, work. I mean, since you are saying give. Exactly. And I'm, give giving, I'm uh -huh. giving from my acts of criminality. Yes. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> nice. <heart> nice. <laughs> Last one, please. For now. Thank you, Pastor, for the talk show. The question I have is in the area you explain about when somebody is asked, you said, uh, like, you are, you are paying for something. You know, you want something, they say, come and sow, so that you get the thing back. I'm looking at the, the case of Hannah, when he asked God for someone. He said, give me this child, and I'll give it back to you. Is it proper now to make a promise to God? Do this for me. This is what I'll give you as thanks. Is that, would that be buying it or bribing God? Thank you. Clap for her, please. Everybody clap, clap, clap. Let me start with the last question and I'll go to the first. Now, what you said is what you call vows. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 1 to 3 speaks about vowing. So when you come to God's presence, you should give a vow. Judges tells us, Jeff shall vow to God. As I'm going to this battle, Lord, if you can give me victory, whoever comes out first in my house shall be dedicated to thee. And his only child, the daughter, came out. Vows was what Anna made. Lord, I'm barren. I vow to you. It's a personal work with God. Now, my challenge is this. When you make vows, vows are personal and not congregational. No pastor can make a vow for you. I make vows every year. My family will do vows. I vowed before on behalf of our church. I encourage people to walk with God through vows. 
You can vow to God and say, God, my first month offering, I will give to you if you preserve me throughout 2013 or 2014. That's a personal walk and relationship with God. We cannot make a doctrinal position out of personal convictions. Did you hear me? Now, what the church is doing is we are making doctrinal positions out of personal convictions and personal walk with God. Sister Tolu prayed personally to God and said, God, please, I want a good husband. If you do so, every year I will give you my first month offering. And God gave her a husband. Now, she now becomes a preacher. She now preaches it and legislates it. That if you want a husband, do as I... That's not scriptural. Don't make a doctrinal position. That is your personal work with God. We all make vows. I will not come to church and impose my personal work with God, my personal vow on my congregation. Some of you may not have enough faith to carry it and say that, oh, you know what I did some years ago before I got this land? I gave God my car. I said, God, I will sow to you my car if you can give me a place for photo. And God provided a place and I gave God my car. Eh? So you said, go and give a car. You are going to give car and nothing will happen. That's your business. I'll take your car. <laughs> and I, I didn't say to you, God said to me to tell you give your car. Now, that's a personal vow. So Christians should make vows. I support vows. But again, it's your personal work with God. What the church should do is teach people to work with God personally. That is a Christianity. Personal relationship with God. That was what Anna did. And Anna's vow paid off. And Anna did not pay a penny for Samuel. Anna made a vow to God. If you give me a child, I'll give him back to you. Anna did not pay for that money. There was no breakthrough seat. It was a breakthrough heart. She gave her heart to God. And God gave the child. And he gave the child back to God. To God. And God now gave five more children to Anna. Five more children. Would you clap for Jesus, everybody? Clap for Jesus. So I support vows. I support vows a lot. And that is your personal. Every year when you come to God's presence, on your Thanksgiving, every year in this church we have a Thanksgiving service. December, the third Sunday. I tell people every first Sunday, second Sunday, make a vow, Lord, this year, do this for me. At Thanksgiving, I will do this for you. God honors his word. What should you do? Keep your own vow. Keep your own vow. That's that. Second question was what? The second question was around... Um... The criminal who is yes. the arm robber. But sir, I just want to quickly also add. What yes. does, he mentioned arm robber. So yes. do we classify the pen robbers with the arm robbers? Oh, or pen robbers. We separate them? Uh, you're a robber. Yeah, oh, okay. You're, you're a robber. Oh, okay. But then you're stealing with pen, okay. you're stealing with arms, okay. you're, you're a robber. Okay. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, sir. <laughs> clap, clap, clap. <laughs> now, my brother, that's a very good question. Ephesians chapter 4, I think says to us that he, that he that work should do a good work. The scripture tells us the kind of job we should do. That means the Bible knows that there are bad jobs and there are good jobs. He said that he that still should still no more, but rather let him work with his hands. That which is good. That means the Bible knows there is bad job and there is good job. Armed robbery is bad job. Now the government has given us some jobs that are bad jobs. Drug pushing is illegal. So if the state has said to you that drop pushing is illegal, that means it's illegal. Drop peddling and drop pushing. Arm robbery is illegal. Now, apart from what the law of the land tells us, our moral consciences also tells us some things. Like some laws do not say abortion is illegal. But religious laws tell us abortion is illegal. So if you're going to be killing children, it's illegal as well. Immoral, maybe not illegal. It may not be illegal in a state, in a land, but it's immoral. So that's what your conscience tells you it is wrong. Now, if you are stealing money in your office, and nobody knows, and you are inflating the thing, it is immoral. You know, those criminal. Now, if you give offering from that one, is it okay? That's a question. No, it's not. Church will take it because we don't know it. But God does. The people that killed Jesus, when Judas noticed that Jesus was going to be crucified, he returned the money to the Pharisees. This is entry. Matthew 26. He said, take this money. Even the Pharisees knew enough. They said, this money is not lawful to be put into the treasury. They returned an ifology. Now, when I say ifology, it is African traditional religion. I see that being practiced today in church. We have imported, some, because it's no more in vogue, or it's no more in, it's no more in the norm to have abalists. 
they've closed their shops. So I've opened churches. Churches is in vogue. So what we do is we have those practices, African traditional practices, being imported into the church. Mm. And so we practice them, we do them. We just use all kind of Christian and scriptures to surround them and we push them forward as church. And that doesn't make it right. Now, giving sacrificially must come from your heart. Watch me. If I coerce you as a pastor on a Sunday morning, I whine you, whine you, whine you, deceive you, lie to you, scam you, and you sincerely Honestly, genuinely, give to God cheerfully. God of heaven will honor your faith, but God will judge me. That's why, clap if you clap. Because you're doing it in the integrity of your heart. That's what Jacob said. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Ahimelech said, Ahimelech. concerning Isaac's wife. He said, I've committed this sin in the integrity of my heart. Genesis 26, in the integrity of my heart. God said to him, because I know it is in the integrity of your heart, that's why I've come to stop you. So God checks and weighs our hearts. However, for those of you that know in your heart, that you are doing kalo kalo with God, you are doing gambling with God, you are doing a yuja yuja with God, that will pay God to give you, then God will honor it. That's why God said to many people, thy faith has made thee whole, thy faith has healed thee. It's not me, it's your faith. Some people don't know that their own faith can take them to the next level in life. But if you know that your pastor is deceiving you and you still give, you are deceiving yourself. That one will not cross the ceiling. Because you too, Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 31, my people love it so. Some people love to be deceived. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah 5, 31. Yeah. God says, don't for, for, leave them alone. They will, they, will, they will linger in suffering and they will linger in penury. Because I won't bless them for that. Mm. Praise God. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. A round of applause for those answers. We've got some interesting questions from the audience, and I'd like to read them all out together. Okay. Um, this one says, I'm not working yet. Yes. Do I need to pay my tithe from the money people give to me? Because tithe is supposed to be 10% of my increase. Okay. Say that again. Do I need to pay money, for, do I need to pay tithe from the money people give me? I'm jobless. Because the principle of tithe is 10% of your increase. <laughs> Interpretation of scripture. Yes. Go ahead. Second one. Um, the scripture about sowing in tears and reaping in joy, which was related to the widow's might. Is this not still sowing and reaping? Again. Um, so I, I, I would like some clarification on this question. I'll skip it. It's not very clear. It say it again. It says the scripture about sowing in tears and reaping in joy, which was related to the widow's might. Yes. Is this not still sowing and reaping? What did she reap? The person that asked that question is probably not hearing me. She didn't, the widow did not give anything, expecting anything like the return. Jesus looked at the widow. She went to church. Yep. Luke 21, verses 1 to 3. Maybe you need to project it for us. What did she reap? Nothing. She gave her all. She wasn't so into a reap. Jesus commended her giving. The principle of sowing and reaping that we practice today in churches, there is, you are naming your seed. If I call it, name your seed. Now, this 1,000 error, I give you a name called my child. So, you're my child, though. You're my child. Because I'm giving you, you're coming back as a child to me. That's not scriptural. First Corinthians chapter 15 tells us that when you sow a grain, it is God that determines the body that your seed will wear. It's not you. Can I go again? First Corinthians chapter 15 tells us that. That when you sow grain, the body that comes back is not what you sowed. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Say, it is God that determines yes. the body yes. that your seed. Yes. We do what? We wear. Yeah. Now if I sow a hundred thousand dollars here, the body that it may wear may be health for one year. Mm. I will not go to the hospital. Mm. That may be the body that my seed is going to wear. It may be protection for my daughter. When there are bullets flying in her school, only I will be protected. It may be my wife's security of her job. Yeah. It may be my members not being killed. God determines the body, not you. When you start determining the body, you are doing ephology. You are doing yeah. you, are, you are telling God, I'm giving this one, I want this back. Okay. God says, no, 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 you are not, so you can't buy it for me. If you want to buy it for me, then it's not for sale. It's an act of grace. But if you are giving to me, 
Then God can say, I will give you what you even you not ask for. I'll give much more. Like God gave to who? Solomon. He asked for so something small. God gave him much more. much more. So the woman in Luke 15, 21 did not, the Bible did not tell us what she ripped. She went to the house of God, dropped her last, and she walked away, and she was happy with God for giving her very last. And Christ said, this is fantastic giving. We didn't know, we don't know to today what she ripped. The Bible is quiet about what you call ripping. But that was a sacrificial giving. Thank you, sir. That was um, the, first, the first one. Yeah, the first one talked about I am jobless, um, yeah. but people give me money. Should I be paying tithe of that since tithe is supposed to be of my increase? Tithe is of your income. If you get that money, it's not an increase. That money you are getting is not an increase. Before you had that money, you are ground zero. They gave you 50,000 naira. You have not increased by 50,000 naira. That's right. Even though you didn't work for it. Mm -hmm. But you are dashed to that money. That is an income. You should pay tithe on your income. What do you call it? Increase? Income? Salary? <laughs> wages? It is money coming to your hand. Coming to your pocket. It is called earnings. You have collected something. Yeah. Pay tithe from it. Don't let you semantics and say it is not pocket money. It is my pocket money. It is not a dash. It is a dash. It is not a salary. It's salary is not wages. It's wages is not allowance. You have taken money. Pay tithe on your income. Clap for Jesus. Thank you. Yeah, this, uh, I, I I've think got two questions in one. For time. Okay, go yeah. ahead. Um, please, sir, I just need to be cleared on Exodus 23 verse 19 because it talks about first fruits. Jesus. So why do you not believe in it? That's the first one from the same person. Should I be monitored to pay my tithe? Because I believe as a Christian who is born again should pay his, his or her vows without monitoring. Say it again. The, the, the first one is talking about first fruits. The second one is about monitoring. Should I be monitored to pay my tithe? Monitored? Yes. I don't know who is monitoring me. Wow. Uh, maybe it's around maybe tight cards, for instance. And so you monitor and, yourself. Okay, this person does, does not pay tight. Jumbo pays tight. Abimelech does not pay tight, etc. Well, I, I'm, and, I'm, uh, I, I'm not sure we should monitor people that pay tight. It's a personal relationship with God. It's what you owe God. If your conscience is pricking you, and you feel being monitored, being watched, it's unfortunate, you're paying. So please, if that question is to Rebecca Sally, I'm just giving you an answer. Clap for Jesus. <laughs> And, and the other one talked about um, first fruit. Yeah. First fruit, let me say it again. I believe in first fruit as long as it is your personal relationship with God. If you have a personal covenant with God, you, Tunde, Akitola, that every year, my first month salary, I will give to God. For that, we take it with all joy, with all thankfulness. We will pray for you. We do not teach this at a doctrine or dogma. I do not believe it is a doctrine from new covenant principle or a dogma. I believe it's a Judaist practice. I believe it belonged to the old constitution. I believe it was in an agrarian community. I believe it was not, it was, they were using crops to pay it. They were using crops. I believe it was not first one salary. It was what comes out first. The first fruit is the first offering of a year. The first offering of a year you give in this church is, a, is given to God. January 1st, every year, yeah. at Foundation of Truth Assembly, yeah. the first offering we give, the first money we spend in our lives, we give it unto God. That is the first fruit of your offering. Now, to now begin to define first fruit as first month salary, I can, there will be no end. Because I can say, after first month salary, I can say first quarter. I can say first allowance. I can say your first, your everything they give to you. First half of the year. So there'll be no end to the first. I can create many firsts in a year for you. So and I think we just refer to the word scam. It's painful for me to say this on, on TV or somewhere else, but we're scamming people. We're scamming people. Christ did not teach it, the apostles did not practice it. We should not teach it. It was not in the early church. Thank you. We shouldn't. 
Okay, um, I received quite a few here. Uh, because of our time, I probably would just, uh, so that I'm not counted as uh, being partial, I just want to go through. <laughs> I'd like to go through maybe two or so and then take, take it at once. Um, this is related to what you just mentioned. Jesus said I did not come. Voice. We should continue. <laughs> we should continue. <laughs>